We're going to begin a sermon series through the book of Nehemiah today, and uh, want to uh, embark on this journey together. I just want to make a quick announcement. Tonight at 5 o'clock is our night of prayer and Lord's Supper. It will begin at 5 o'clock this evening, um, and uh, we'll have a time of prayer uh, corporately, individually, and then we will have a time of uh, Lord's Supper uh, this evening. And so deacons will be serving, so be here uh, tonight at 5, if, if at all possible. So Nehemiah chapter 1, I want to pray, and then uh, we'll hit the ground running. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a time we have here to, uh, to study your word. Um, thank you for the opportunity to lift up our voices in praise to you. Uh, for the choir and Jonathan and leading us and, and just declaring that, that you are up to something good and uh, we can stand in your love and just uh, we're always waiting in you and the word. And so I just, I'm thankful for that time that we had this morning in worship. Uh, I have nothing to say this morning apart from your word, Father. So as we walk through this chapter together, I pray that you would give me the words you'd have me to say, that you would hide me behind the cross. Father, I pray for clarity. This morning, as, as I preach, um, I pray for conviction of the Spirit in my heart and our hearts. Um, I pray, God, for power, that uh, you would just fill me with your Spirit, God, and that you would speak through me. And I pray for obedience uh, for, for all of us this morning, God. So we give this time back to you. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, we are 17 Sundays, including today, away from the end of 2019. Um, and if it doesn't get cold around here, my, we're going to have a problem. Uh, November 24th is Harvest Sunday. December the 8th, uh, the choir will have Christmas worship service. December 22nd will be Christmas Sunday before Christmas. December 29th, uh, we'll have a Gideon guest speaker that day. And so for 13 of the 17 Sundays till the end of the year, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. And so we're just going to walk through this book together. Uh, we're going to take it a Sunday at a time and just see what the Lord has for us with the idea of rebuild, restore, and revive. I'd originally kind of planned for us to do a sermon series on the gospel-centered family, um, but I've just been uneasy in my spirit and talking with Jonathan and, and the staff and just working through some things, um, just spent some time alone with the Lord this week and just felt like he was just leading us to this book. And so um, we'll just see what the Lord has for us. I know some of you are like, we're going to spend 13 weeks in a book in the Old Testament. Yes, yes, we are. Um, and I thought about that, and then I thought about Paul's words in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. This is what Paul says. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the Scriptures. So I think about this verse, and I think about for the next 13 weeks as we travel through this book, that was, what was written in the past in Nehemiah, and at the end of the Old Testament time was written for our instruction, that we have something to learn from this book, that we have something that we can take and, and apply to our individual lives and our families and our corporate life, and that we would find in, endurance and encouragement through the scriptures. And so I thought about this verse, and I thought about our time together, and uh, in this book as we study it through the book of Nehemiah. So this morning, I just want us to walk through these first 11 verses, 11 and a, and, and a half, if you will, and just two points for our time together this morning. The first thing I want us to see in the book of Nehemiah chapters uh, one, verses one through three, is Nehemiah's humble response to tragic news. Nehemiah's humble response to tragic news. So let's kind of jump into the text here and just kind of walk through this chapter together. Verse one. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. During the month of Keslev, in the 20th year, while I was in the fortress city of Susa. All right, so let's get our bearings to make sure we know what's going on. So here's this guy named Nehemiah. Nehemiah is uh, under the working with a king by the name of King Artaxerxes. We'll get to that in just a little bit. And this is the month of the year of Keslev. Now, Keslev in the Jewish calendar is somewhere between around November, December area. And so it's the winter time. And that's why they're in the city of Susa. So just kind of on a map for you to understand. So Jerusalem is way over here. Then you have the, the Mesopotamia uh, area. You have the Euphrates River. You have King, the Tigris River. And way over here on the bottom is the city of Susa. So during the winter time, the king would go all the way down to the city of Susa into this fortified 
fortress. And so Nehemiah is way over here in Susa, and the Jerusalem is way over here. And so this was the route that Nehemiah and Ezra would take to get from Susa over to Tadmar, over down to Damascus, and over to Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah, one day, sitting there, and the Bible says that he gets a visitor. Verse 2, Hananiah, one of my brothers, who I believe was actually one of his brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about two things. One, I questioned them about Jerusalem, and the other, I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. So, so, so uh, Han and I comes, and, and he looks at his brother, and he's like, I just want to know a couple of things. First of all, how is the city doing, and then how are the people of the city who survived captivity? Now, if you'll remember from, from just Old, Old Testament history, captivity ended from the Babylonians in 538 B.C., when the Persians conquered Babylon. So the nation of Israel was able to go back. Remember, Cyrus told them, you're to return, you can rebuild the city, you can rebuild the walls. And so the nation of Israel had been sent back under the, uh, the permission of Cyrus the king because the Babylonians had been conquered. And so he heads into the city and Nehemiah's like, man, I want to know, how's everybody doing? How's the farm? How's the house? How are the kids? How are the, how's the city walls? How's everything happening there? Verse three. So they said to me, First, the remnant. The remnant in the providence who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Now think about the weight of this. If you lived a long way away, suppose you lived in Seattle and you got a visitor from a family member and you said, hey, tell me about how mom and dad's doing. Tell me how the uncles are doing. And they sat you down and they said, you know what? They're in great trouble and disgrace. And you can just read in the text, the weight begins to sit on the shoulders of Nehemiah. And then he says, here's what's going on in the city. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned. This is tragic news. This guy loved the nation of Israel, loved the people. And he says, man, the city is destroyed. The, 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 the gates have been burned down. The wall has not been rebuilt. And the people are in great trouble and they are in great um, disgrace. Now, now add that to it, but then think about this. If you go back, Ezra chapter, Ezra is the very next book. If you go to Ezra chapter four, so just, I just want you to get this because I think this is incredibly important. Ezra chapter four, there's a king by the name of King Artaxerxes. King Artaxerxes finds out about the nation of Israel and they're rebuilding the city and they're rebuilding the temple. Ezra chapter four, you can read it when you get home. In Ezra chapter four, and people begin to flip out about it. And then Ezra chapter four, verse 21, King Artaxerxes issues a command and a letter to the nation of Israel. And this is what he says. Therefore, issue an order to these men to stop so that this city will not be rebuilt until a further decree has been pronounced by me. And so King Artaxerxes, the guy who Nehemiah works for, Nehemiah chapter two, sends a letter back to Jerusalem and says, this is what you need to do. Stop rebuilding the city. Stop rebuilding the walls. In fact, if you read on in Ezra chapter 4, you're going to see that the nation of Israel was forced into this, that they, they weren't allowed to rebuild the city, re- allowed to, be, to, to rebuild the walls. And so here's Nehemiah. He loves the nation of Israel, loves the Israelites, loves Jerusalem, and he asks how everybody is at home, and he says, man, the the people are disgraced, and they're, they're, they're weighted down, and the city's been burned down, and the city's been destroyed, and it's all because of the guy that you work for. King Artaxerxes issued a decree and said, stop building, and so they stop building. So you're sitting here thinking, I know what you're thinking, what's the big deal about a wall that hasn't been rebuilt? What what does it matter that, that a wall around the city has not been Built back up. Well, I'll give you two reasons why I think this is important. First, the wall would provide protection for the nation of Israel. A wall would be around that. It would keep enemies from getting out. And so the nation of Israel would be inside Jerusalem, but the wall would serve as a, as a barrier of protection. Well, let me tighten it up a little bit. A few weeks ago, a man by the name of Andrew Luck, who this guy is here. This is Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck, quarterback for the Colts. The Colts actually got rid of Peyton Manning so they could bring this guy in to be quarterback. This guy's a graduate from Stanford University, has an engineering degree, one of the smartest guys to ever play the football, but he quit playing this year. This year. He retired from the NFL. So I was doing some reading. I thought, why in this, would this girl, why would this, not this girl, this guy walk away. Don't tell him I said that. Walk away from NFL football. And I did some reading, and I thought, man, you know what? This guy, look look at these injuries this guy has sustained. Torn cartilage in two ribs. Partially torn abdomen. 
a lacerated kidney, at least one concussion that we know of, a torn labrum in his throwing shoulder. The labrum is the cartilage in between your shoulder and your arm right below your rotator cuff. I think that's right. Dr. Morris, I think. And so the torn labrum and, his, and, 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 and this mystery calf ankle issue that led to this. This is a ton of injuries for a guy. Now, this is just what we know of this been then. And I did some reading, and you know why this guy had suffered so many injuries? When he began his NFL career, the, the Indianapolis Colts spent all this money on this quarterback and a few other positions, and they had one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL. So you had this guy who was a quarterback who was dropping back and literally running for his life from defensive end to defensive tackles, lacerating his kidney, tearing up his shoulder, concussion, being beat up because he wasn't being protected by the offensive line. It's so because his protection wasn't taking care of him. He had to retire early for his life so that he would be able to spend it with his family and kids. Just like the nation of Israel and this wall that was around it would serve as a wall of protection for the people that when the wall was torn down, it opened them up to other things. But not just protection. If I, just, just think about, bless you, and just think about this for just a second. Not just protection, but for posterity too. You know, whenever I go anywhere in the state of Arkansas and I talk with pastors and I meet them at the convention or prayer meetings or whatever, or just meet people in general, I, I tell them where they say, where are you pastor? I say, second Baptist Jacksonville. Do you know what the first thing 90% of the people say to me? They ask this question, how are your schools? I mean, wherever I, wherever I go, whether it's Northeast Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas, Russellville, Little Rock, whether I meet a pastor from the south side of the state or whatever, without fail, I get asked this question, well, how are the schools? And I get to talk about how we built, we built this new high school and there's new elementary being built. And I talk about how the junior high principal goes to our church and we minister to, to various places around our community. But everybody, nobody asks me, man, how's the burger at the fried pie shop? Nobody says, have you bought a car from Crane or Guatney? Nobody ever asked me, man, did you try the fish at the hook? Like, I don't get asked any of those questions. What I get asked about is the school, because the school is when people think about our city, that's what the first thing that they go to. So for the nation of Israel, they have this wall built, and so the Israelites around the area would be talked about in this wall setting. So the wall would serve as protection, and the wall would serve as posterity for the nation of Israel. So Nehemiah gets word that the city has been destroyed and the walls have not been rebuilt. And so he goes back, he begins to be broken for this. And so you see Nehemiah's humble response to tragic news. Then you hear Nehemiah's honest prayer to Yahweh God. So let's study this prayer in the balance of our time together. I want you to notice a few things about his prayer. First, I want you to notice his posture. Now there are nine prayers in the book of Nehemiah. This is the longest one. But I want you to notice his posture. Verse four. When I heard these words... I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of the heavens. Go back one slide. When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I fasted and I prayed. So Nehemiah gets the word and what does he do? He just collapses on the ground. He sits down and as he sits there, he begins to weep. He begins to cry out to God. He begins to fast in his, in his life and his brokenness for where the city is. He's broken for, the, for where they are as a nation of Israel. And he sits down thousands of miles away in Susa and he sits and his heart is broken and he's weeping and he's crying. But I want you to know something. I think this is incredibly important. It says here in the text, I mourned for a number of days. So I think a couple things. One, this is not a, man, I prayed this before I went to bed. Man, I joined up on one night, I gathered with some people, and I prayed. Man, I, I, I had a moment where, where I kind of prayed for a little bit. The Bible says he spent a number of days. Well, how many days did he spend? Well, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? Go back to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakali, during the month of Keslev, circle the month. This is March, I mean, I'm sorry, this is November, uh, December time frame. Then you go to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, and here's what the Bible says. During the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Here's the deal. This is March 1. So for five months, 
For five whole months, this guy named Nehemiah weeps and prays and cries out to God and fasts. This is not a one-night passing prayer before the family went to bed. This is not a one-night thing on a night of prayer or a during the month of this or, or a during this activity. For five whole months, this man, Nehemiah, falls down on his face before God. He's weeping and praying and fasting and crying out in front of the presence of God. Not just his posture, but keep going on. What does he do? The first thing he does is he gives praise to God, right? Verse 5, he says this. During, verse 5. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. He just begins in this petition and praise to God. Now think about this. Nehemiah, for five months, I just couldn't get over that. Crying out to God, repeatedly praising God, fasting and weeping. In the beginning of every prayer, he is declaring the greatness and the glory and the power and the sovereignty of God. For five months, his prayer to the God of heavens, Yahweh, the great and awe-inspiring God, who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commandments. And I thought about that, and I was like, you know what? Isn't that exactly what we read in the Psalms of Ascent? Psalms well, chapter 121, verse 1, God is our helper. Psalms 122, verse 8, he's the maker of heaven and earth. Psalms 134, verse 3, he's the maker of heaven and earth. And there's just this declaration in praise to God at the beginning of his prayer. But isn't that exactly how Jesus told us to begin our prayers? Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. He says this, therefore you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Exactly what Jesus told us to pray and the pattern is exactly how Nehemiah began to pray. Don't miss this prayer, church. Broken before God. And he just begins to praise God. God, you are a holy God. You are a great and awe-inspiring God. You are a covenant-keeping God. You are the creator of heavens and earth God. Oh, that we would begin our prayers from the very moment we pray in this declaration of the greatness and the power and the holiness and the sovereignty and the majesty of God. God, you are great. But then notice this petition, verses six and seven. Verse six, he says this, please be attentive. He says, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night. God, would you, would you so incline your ear? Now think about this. Let's just think. Lean in here real close. The creator of the world, the sustainer of all things, the one who holds everything in his right hand, the one who spoke everything into existence, the one who holds your life in the palm of his hand, he is begging him, would you listen to my prayer? Would you, would you lend your ear? Would you pay attention to me in this prayer? And I keep going back to forgive me, but for five months, God, would you listen to our prayer? Would you pay attention to this, this prayer that I'm praying night and day? Keeps going. For your servants, the Israelites, he says, I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. Nehemiah, just, just hear my heart. Nehemiah is broken for this nation. And he just begins confessing the sins that we have committed against you. I and my father's family have sinned. Here's the thing. I want you to come in real close to this. Ne Nehemiah is not sitting down and praying and weeping and blaming other people. That wall would have been rebuilt if, 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 if Howard would have just done his job. Well, if, if Lucy would have done what she was supposed to do, if Frank would have taken care of his responsibilities, nowhere in that. He sits down and he literally says, God, we have sinned. And he begins to confess the sins, not of only him or his family. And there's just, there's just no pushing of blame to other people. And I thought, you know what? Remember Adam and Eve? 
Remember Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned and, and God came to Adam and Adam's blaming Eve and Eve's blaming, uh, blaming the snake and the snake doesn't have a leg to stand on. And in this moment here, I have preacher jokes, stay with me. And he, so he's praying, there's this passing of blame here. I think how many times in our lives do we blame other people for the things that are going on in our life instead of taking responsibility for our own selves? And Nehemiah is saying, we have sinned, you, I have sinned, the nation of Israel has sinned, our fathers have sinned, I have sinned, crying out in the spirit of forgiveness. He goes on in verse 7 and he says this, we have acted, this comprehensive, we have acted corruptly towards you, we have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances that you gave your servant Moses. He just leave nothing out. It's not like we've been obedient in this area, but we, we were disobedient here. He just says this comprehensive confession that we have not acted, we have, we have acted corruptly, we've not kept your commands, we've not kept your statutes, statutes, we've not kept your ordinances. You gave your servant Moses. And there's just confession to the Lord, just confession of sin. But I want you to see something. I can't go past this before we keep going. I want you to see this in what he says here. He says in verse 6, one, and then he says it again in verse 7. He says, we have committed against you. Verse 7, he says this. Toward you and, and have not kept the commandments. We have sinned towards you. And I thought, you know what? That's like, sin at its root is theological. We don't sin against each other. We sin against God. So when we have sin, when we sin, we confess that to the Lord, our sin is, is against God. In fact, isn't this exactly what David prayed in Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, when David says this, against you and you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So this is confession. So we sin, we, we've done these things, and this is brokenness before God. And so, so not just petition, then he goes on to his plea, verses 8 and 11. In verse 8 he says, please remember what you have commanded your servant, Moses. He says, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter among you the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather you from there and bring them to the place where I ch chose to have my name dwell. Do you know what's interesting about this portion of the prayer? Nehemiah is literally quoting and praying scriptures. So write this down. Nehemiah, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 25. God says, when you have children and grandchildren and have been in the land a long time and you have acted corruptly, make an idol in the form of anything and do what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, angering him, I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that you will quickly perish from the land you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. Go back. You will not live long there, but you will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be reduced to a few survivors among the nations where the Lord your God will drive you. Verse 28. There you will worship man-made gods of woods and stones which cannot see, hear, eat, or smell. But... From there you will search for the Lord your God and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart and all of your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you in the future, you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. He will not leave you, destroy you, or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them by oath because the Lord your God is a compassionate God. You keep going, the scriptures in Deuteronomy. Next, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Just as the Lord was glad to cause you to prosper and to multiply you, so he will also be glad to cause you to perish and to destroy you. You will be ripped out of the land you are entering to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from the one end of the earth to the other, and there you will worship other gods of wood and sto stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. You will find no peace among those nations, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give you a trem trembling heart, failing eyes, and a despondent spirit. Your life will hang in doubt before you. You will be in dread night and day, never certain of survival. In the morning you will say, if only it were evening. In the evening you will say, if only it were morning. Because of the d dread you will have in your heart and because of what you will see. Then you go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. When all these things happen to you, the blessings and curses I have set before you, and you come to your senses while you are in the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, 
and you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all of your heart and with all of your soul by doing everything I am commanding to you today, then he will restore your fortunes, have compassion on you and gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Even if your exiles are in the farthest horizon, he will gather you and bring you back from there. The Lord your God will bring you into the land your fathers possessed and you will take possession of it. He will cause you to prosper and to multiply you more than he did your fathers. The Lord will God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants and you will love him with all of your heart and your soul so that you will live. The Lord your God will put all these curses and all your enemies who hate and persecute you. Then you will again obey him and follow all of his commands I am commanding you today. The Lord your God will make you prosper abundantly in all the works of your hands, your offspring, the offspring of your livestock, the produce of your land. Indeed, the Lord will again delight in your prosperity. Verse 10, as he delighted in that of your fathers, when you obey the Lord your God by keeping his commands and statutes that are written in his book of the law and return to him with all of your heart and all of your soul. I can just imagine for five months, Nehemiah quoting these portions of Deuteronomy, where God says, if you go into the land and you disobey me, if you go into the land and you do not hold my statutes, I'm going to punish you. But when you return to me with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind, I will bless you and protect you and take care of you. So I just imagine in my heart that Nehemiah from Keslev to Nisan sat and wept and prayed and cried, confessed sin, cried out to God and reminded God, God, remember what you said to the nation of Israel before we entered the promised land and through Moses. Remember the covenant that you made. Remember the promise that you made, that you will be with us, that you will travel with us, that you will take care of us. And so he goes on to verse 10 and he says, they are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant so that to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. And so here's this picture. Nehemiah gets word, walls are torn down. The people are in disgrace. He's broken. He's crying out to God, fasting and weeping, confessing. There's no blame. There's no anger. There's no frustration. There's no, I can't believe this. There's no loss of hope. There's this reminder, God, you are there. You, you, are, you are with us. Remember our prayer. Remember the covenant that you make with us. As I was studying this chapter, I kept having this thought come to my mind over and over and over and over again. When I became your pastor, I came to meet with you guys in the gym. And it was an open session of questioning and you guys asked questions. I honestly thought that the newspaper was there because there was this man with a steno pad, Mr. Hurley, who was writing down everything. And I was like, man, they ain't playing here. And so he's writing down. Miss Nancy couldn't make it. But I got asked one of the greatest questions I think you can ever ask in view of a call by a man by the name of Bob Sherman. And Bob Sherman raised his hand and he said, I see you have a beard. Do you ever shave it? <laughs> and I thought, well, sometimes. <laughs> I grew to love Bob Sherman. When I would meet on Wednesday mornings on this front row right here with some of you men and Bob, Bob would pray heaven down just to sit. This morning I was sitting in my office and I thought I could hear the words of Bob praying for this church, for each of you. And I could hear the words of Bob and now Bob and did his funeral a couple of years ago. We have a prayer room over here that has a plaque in it in honor of Bob Sherman. And I read this Nehemiah chapter one and I kept thinking about Bob. A man who was known for his prayer. A man who was known for crying out to the Lord. A man who was known for his passion and compassion for the church and the Lord in his prayer. And I began to think throughout the week and honestly began to pray. God, would you raise up more Bob Shermans? Young to old. 
Would you raise up a generation of Bob Shermans within our church who were just known as prayer warriors? Would you raise up a generation of Bob Shermans within our fellowship? Would you raise up a generation of Nehemiahs within our fellowship who were known as people who cried out in the presence of God, who were known as people who never let go in prayer, who were known as people that were prayer warriors for them and for the church? Would you raise up a a, a Bob, would you raise up a Nehemiah who would be so committed to prayer, who would be so committed and broken, would be so driven. And I thought, we can have Monday nights alive. We can have Sunday night prayers, gatherings. We can have church on Sunday morning and Wednesday night church. We can have all types of activities. But when we as a church cry out to God in prayer, in brokenness, and commitment to the Lord, I believe we'll begin to see some incredible things in our young families, in our senior adults, in our children, that we would begin to see, as we'll see through the rest of this book in the book of Nehemiah, God moving within our fellowship. Let's pray.